And we're live! <laughs> <laughs> That's different to Maya's. <laughs> <laughs> I, I liked it last time when she tried to imitate mine. It was quite cute. <laughs> right. oh. hmm. There it is. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story once a week. I'm Rami. I'm Anise. I'm Maya. And I'm Gerald. This week's story is called Strays by Mark Richard, and it talks about two young boys being pretty much abandoned or left alone in the house by their parents because their mother had run away and their father went off to try to find her. And they're left in the care of their alcoholic and gambling addicted uncle. And we see how their neglect impacts the outcome of this story. Mm. Okay. Rabbi? Short intro. Yep. I love you for this story. I just gotta say, just gotta get that out there. <laughs> oh, well, I can't take any credit for it. It's my friend Molly. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. Yes, thank hey. you very much, Molly. So, top level, how did everybody like their dislike the story? I loved it. How about everybody else? I liked it. Yeah, I sorry. really, really liked. It. Did he say sorry? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. And you then I had to sorry? back off to beef. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. I'm fighting Rami. Yeah, well, that wasn't maybe, very maybe subtle. You can that change was... my mind. <laughs> we will. The show isn't. Our purpose isn't to change your mind. This isn't the let's teach Rami to like literature show. <laughs> Ooh, ouch. I know, low blow. I was just gonna that's fight him physically. Harsh. No, he has that's his own cool. taste. You know, so let's start with him yeah. since it seems like he's the only one that wasn't like completely just like. Oh. So Rami. No, I. I because I mean, my I don't have much to say about it, so I'm interested to hear what other people liked about it so much. Maybe I missed things or didn't consider other things. Well, as you read it, um, how did you feel? Did you feel kind of blah? Did you feel like excited at some parts, let down at others? Yeah, I mean, so when I finished it, I kind of, it was one of those things when I had to look it up to try to see what other people had to say about it. And usually when it comes to me having to do that at the end of a story, it's a sign for me that maybe it wasn't as clear or maybe, you know, the plot wasn't as strong as I would have anticipated, which kind of prompts me to try to look into it further. Interesting. Did, did you think, is that it at the end? <laughs> That's, what you said. That's just a question commentary to see, you know, did I miss something or what's going on here? And, and actually there isn't much actually written about it because I don't think the story is too well known. Well, when I was done reading it, I was blown away, but I will, I think it's interesting that you said that because there were, there was a part where I had to reread it once where I was like, hmm, was that exactly, was that what I read? And that was the part when um, in the morning after the uncle wins all their toys and then he goes away and then all of a sudden the bicycle and they're talking about the black family and then all of a sudden the uncle's doing something. I'm like, did the uncle come back? Um, and at that point, there was confusion there. It wasn't exactly clear. And so I think that's interesting that Rami had to look it up and that he usually does that when things aren't clear. I think that's an interesting statement. For me, I don't mind it. Um, when I get the urge to look something up after I've read it, that tells me I like the story a lot. If something was slightly confusing and I don't look it up, that's a sign that I just didn't like the story because I didn't even care enough to look it up. But <laughs> in this case, I, I reread that section. And I, a lot of times when I have to reread a section, I feel irritated or annoyed that I'm rereading something. But I didn't feel that. I was excited to reread that section and kind of decipher what was happening. And I um, found it really enjoyable. Yeah. Um, so 
I think for me the thing that hooked me from the beginning that made me realize this is a story I'm going to love was just very simply the language because right in the beginning I loved the casualness with which you would write really bizarre evocative events like um, sticks my brother and my Easter Sunday drawings in her mouth like the mom just eats their drawings and it's just like casually thrown in there with this kind of subdued language or um, there is an exploded chicken on the grill of Uncle Trash's car just casually there's a ch you know without drawing too much like it's not like I feel like in another short story it would be like and there was a chicken this is how we knew that this would be the day where everything would go downhill no there's just a chicken or and you just move on or a paragraph description of the bloody chicken stuck in yeah exactly and this is just like there's a chicken <laughs> <laughs> and you just yeah. move on uh, and as soon as I saw that kind of language and that sort of playfulness uh, I knew I was going to love this author Especially the story that's quite grim. It was nice to see little bits of humor, a little bit of absurdity, which kept it from, you know, wanting you to cut your own veins. Yeah, I think that was important. You know, when before in the pre-show, I mentioned that I thought this um, story was very Carver-esque, and when I said that, it was it, I was referring to the simplicity and how simply extraordinary events are written. Like Carver will do that. He will have something majorly disruptive happening in a family's life, and it's written really simply. And it took me a long time to learn to appreciate that. And there, there's a little bit of that in here, but with the added absurdity and humor that is often lacking in Carver. And so, yeah, I, I definitely, definitely appreciated those parts, Annie's. Mm -hmm. How about you, Joe? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think I, I'm the same as Annie. So I, th I think you know within a paragraph or so whether you're going to enjoy a story. And and once you and, and you know as long as there's no mistakes and as long as there's no hitches in the writing, then then you at least have that level of enjoyment. And and then as it as this story went on, as, as Annie said, it's just little things dropped in without explanation, without laboring the point it's just that's that's there and that's that and 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 you you build up a picture I, I loved Trash I, I think Trash is a great character yeah uh, he really is maybe, maybe not the best person to leave in charge of your kids but uh, <laughs> still <laughs> his, really na good. his name even like Uncle Trash yeah. that's just Uncle Trash yeah. that's fantastic <laughs> is that a real well, name do other people call Trash he probably lives in a junkyard. Okay. He probably like owns a junkyard or something. That's that, that, that. When I think of an Uncle Trash, I picture a guy that either lives in a junkyard or has a really messy house, and everyone just calls him Uncle Trash. I don't think anybody's name is Trash, Mister and Mrs. Trash. Okay. <laughs> I I didn't think that deeply about the name because he does it again with Mister and Mrs. Cuts. Because remember, one of the biggest jokes is after all, like the, the, these kids' lives are falling apart. Everything save the house burning down at this point. Uh, and then Mrs. Cuts comes to cut their hair, and then they're like, "No, but we know better," because all the kids <laughs> think that the cuts eat children. Like there was just this like, first of all, that humor was very necessary there because it came after the point where you realize they've been abandoned for months and they have bug bites everywhere that are infected and are just living this horrible, destitute life. So at that point, like a little bit of humor is very necessary. And also this humor is only happening because you're in the point of view of a child. So that it kind of brings that uh, to the forefront and makes the joke that much funnier, I think. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I appreciate about this story is there were multiple layers of symbolism and resonance throughout the story that it wasn't a story where I had to think for a long time to figure it out. It was like I was reading it. I wasn't thinking on that level. And then the minute I was done reading, I was like, oh, that's what they was doing. That's what he was doing. And I thought that was really interesting. So I'm really curious, what types of things stood out for you as far as symbolism? Okay. I could go, but... Yeah, you go. Okay. Gerald so has think... that look. Yeah. yeah. I think I'm just going to go for the low-hanging fruit, the biggest and most obvious symbol, and then I'm just going to collect my 200 and pass go. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the strays, um, I guess, would be the biggest, most obvious symbol because they're sort of trapped in this meager, tragic existence, much like the boys. So I feel like the strays and the boys, there's a big connection there. I think it's no coincidence that the fire happens at the same time for both of them. 
the one dog is lit on fire because again kids are they don't know everything you know like they need more supervision uh, and that same event causes the entire house to catch fire and it, it's it's like uh, both the strays and the children are sort of caught in events that are bigger than them that they cannot control and they're just homeless and destitute by the end of it. Definitely. And the strays, I, I mean, at first it, it's, it's really obvious that the strays are the other side of the coin. You know, it, it's, it's a reflection of what the children are going through, but it's also a reflection of this family and their economic status. And so we're talking about a very poor, white, rural family. And in essence, they're strays too. Um, the mom runs off, what's the dad going to do? He's either going to stay and not have a mom, or he's going to go after her. And obviously, he's not in an economic position, takes kids with him, doesn't even have a car. And you're in a town where the only place to get groceries is this black family, but everybody is doesn't go into the black family's house because they're black. You know, you don't go in. But they're they're economically in a better position than the white families because the white families are having to buy groceries on credit, and so the reaction of the of the families, the tell you know the rumors that go through the children that the black family eat children and that they're evil and things, you know, I think that it's an interesting reflection. And so when I see the stray dogs and they're trapped in this existence and they're skittish and they're scared and they run off and they come back, I see that in the children, but I also see that in Uncle Tux, I see that in the dad. Um, it, I see that rippling throughout the community where this community really is a community of strays. Yeah, and, and there's there's a bit um, there's a bit where uh, Uncle Trash uh, introduces them to gambling and gets everything off them, and uh, and and the, the the main character says, "I'm burning hot at Uncle Trash, then I'm burning hot at my father for leaving us, then I'm burning hot at my mother for running off." So there there's a bit of you know the the sort of burning hot thing obviously comes back later on to um, uh, as as the the sort of climax of the story, but interesting yeah. that that he uses that as as a as a way of saying that he's he's angry with them. Mm -hmm. And how Uncle Trash is all every time he leaves, he says, "Don't burn the house down." Yeah, Don't burn exactly. The house down. Yeah. Even after the house is actually burned down, what is his parting words to the children? Don't burn the house <laughs> down. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And I thought it was really economy. masterful that the author, even though he has the uncle say several times, don't burn the house down, I still didn't see it coming when the house burnt down. Somehow, yeah. like, here's this obvious foreshadowing that you can only see in retrospect, so it's, like, post-foreshadowing. <laughs> like, after it <laughs> happens, I'm like, oh, he told me it was going to happen. And I still okay, thought it's I was the expression only that one a lot that of was... people use. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I, I feel so good that I wasn't the only one that was playing excited about that because I, I kind of was like, was like well, how did I not see that coming because it totally blindsided me too I had the same reaction yeah but even that I would have liked a little bit of embellishment because it, it kind of just says okay and then the dog caught on fire ran under the house and then the entire house burned down I think so the, the way that it's casually um, reported or stated kind of takes away from its significance for me in the story and the the absurd elements of it m made me think that it was kind of teetering on like fantasy and and there were several moments within the story and I had like pause and even at the end when I was just trying to ask myself wait so are these people well no actually I got it at the end but throughout the story I was thinking are, are these characters even human like maybe at the end it's gonna be like, oh and they were actually like flies or something like that I don't know <laughs> but it, yeah you, because it, it just some of it just really absurd. No. but I, I think as uh, I think as is, is, uh, I don't know who said it but earlier on but but I mean that that's that's part of the charm of the story that that it is that, that the plot line is quite ludicrous and quite extreme and yet the author, yeah, Maya said it. That the author is is just treats it, treats it with almost irreverence. So yeah, the the dog caught fire, and, and then the dog set fire to the house, and and it's just um just yeah, it's just how he writes. It's just 
that's that's what happened. You know, it's, I was listening to a podcast on writing recently, and they were talking about writing emotionally, and I don't remember what show it was. It might have been writing excuses. It might have been something else. It might have been, I, I don't know. It was one of the shows that focuses on craft. And um, someone made the statement that when you are writing, I don't know, it was right up here, um, made the statement that, that when you're writing really emotionally, if you write super emotionally, then the reader can't feel the emotions because they're too worried about the character. Whereas if you pull back a little bit on the emotionality of the writing, then the reader has more of an opportunity to be worried and concerned and really get into the, what the character must be feeling because it's not completely spelled out. And I see that as what this story does. And for me, it does it really well. But I can see how, if you're not used to that kind of sparse writing as far as emotional sparsity, that that can get, like, go right over your head. Because I remember when I first started reading Carver, I've talked to you about this, girl. When I first started reading Carver, the first year I was like, and what's the big deal? <laughs> <laughs> because he does that. I was like, what's so special? It took me several stories to learn to appreciate that. And so I'm wondering if maybe that is some of what's happening here because at no point do you see the kids really falling apart. You see the little brother fall apart a little bit through the big brother's eyes, and the reaction is, how can I make him stop crying, essentially? Mm. Um, but at no point, it doesn't really cater, it doesn't pander to our emotions, it doesn't like call for our sympathies and make us weep. Yeah, but it still elicited an emotion from me because uh, I didn't, so not only did I not see the fire coming, I didn't see a lot of things coming. So like, you know, first it's like, oh, and then there's one night when the parents are gone, I'm like, all right, mom's gone, and maybe things got a little complicated, it's one night, and all of a sudden it's like, and the July corn is here, but we started at Easter. So like, just because there was like no, just, I, I feel like I was being disoriented, like it was pulling the rug out from under me. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, so Uncle Trash is having Mrs. Cuts come to do a little bit of housekeeping, a little bit of child care, and they have uh, in, infected bites. So because things were just sort of thrown in, I feel like I did have an emotional response that was accompanied by my own sort of disequilibrium. Because I thought, I, I was like, okay, it's one night. And then it's like, nope, it's been months. And it's like, okay, well, but they're in the house and they're more or less okay. It's like, no, they're basically living like strays. Yeah. And that confusion, that lack of grounding, mirrors what the children would have been feeling. Yeah. I think yeah. that the way it's written, you know, the fantastical elements, for example, um, there are parts of it that are kind of fantastical, but I remember being a third grader, and my thinking process was kind of fantastical. Like, like we would go in the woods and play, and we would play gypsies, and we would play Tom Sawyer, and my brain was all over the place, and colors were bright, and when I look back at that point in my childhood, things were bright, things were fantastical, everything was new, everything was an adventure, and so those fantastical elements didn't really hit me as odd, because it seemed to be really well done for the age, it kind of told me what age these kids were, actually. <laughs> you know, mm. the way it was written, I was like, oh, okay, so they're probably right around third grade, his little brother's probably in second, you know, like, that's where my head was at as I was reading it. Although, I will say, for a while, I thought the older brother was actually a sister. You thought the older mm. brother was what? I thought it was a girl. I thought it was a sister Me and a little too. brother. Because of the way um, she he cares for his little brother, I thought it was a sister. Mm. Which is, is totally sexist and, and for me to say that, but as I'm reading it, the way it's characterized, the caretaking, but the irritation at first struck me as a young female character. And then over the course of the story, I realized, no, 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 it's brother. Yeah, I was worried Uncle Trash would abuse the kids, but... Um, yeah, 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 I totally thought it was a little girl, and Uncle Trash was going to get drunk one night. Yeah, that, that was in my head. <laughs> was wow, that's funny. funny. I... I, from the beginning, assumed the older sibling was a boy, and at no point did I think Uncle Trash would physically abuse them. Like, that never even crossed my mind, even though I'm usually, like, the first one to be, like, <laughs> who's about to get abused. But I didn't. <laughs> yeah, I didn't this time for whatever reason. I think there was something about his swagger that made it very clear to me. He's not interested in the kids at all. He just wants money and booze, money and booze. And I think that focus on money and booze convinced me that he's not looking at these kids or living at these kids in any untoward way. He would love to take their stuff and sell it because, again, money and booze. Um, so I think that focus 
did, didn't lead me to... I tend to be the first one to be like, and I thought they were going to abuse him, but I didn't mm -hmm. this time. Although I will say earlier you were saying the black family, the black family. I thought the cuts were white because of the way that they described the, um, the little black boy that they hired because it wasn't their kid and it was this way of like, you know, the color boy that the cuts hired. And that language to me seemed very much like the cuts were white for some reason. I don't know why that to me was like, a dog whistle for that. Although they could be black and it wouldn't make a difference in the story. Yeah, later la later on as he's describing going to the cuts with his mother, he talks about the fact that they weren't allowed to go inside because the cuts are, are black, essentially. And that he knows that the cuts eat children and that's why they don't have any. And that he would count how many kids would go in and how many kids would come out when he never was there long enough to figure it out. Yeah, and but again, I... I... Mm-hmm. No, I was just going to say, but I read that differently. So I thought the reason why it was kind of shameful for them to go in there to go grocery shopping is because that's the poor people store. Like, that's where people go and buy things on credit. And that normally white families should be wealthier and shop somewhere else, but his family is so poor, they have to go shop at that. Like, I thought that's what he yeah. was zeroing in on. The, like, conflation of class and, 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 I, I, and I was seeing that, but I was seeing that as it's even more so because they're so poor that they're having to buy on credit from a black family. Yeah, I mean, it could be. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll have to go back and reread that portion, but I definitely got the impression that the cuts were black as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I love I love the fact that, that Uncle Trash won uh, Mrs. Cuts <laughs> to come and do some cleaning at a card game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Uncle Trash, do you see he was looking after them? See, he is looking after the kids. And he, when he took all their stuff, what did he do with it? He bought a bicycle. Yeah. He didn't have a car. Like, in his own roundabout way, he was kind of trying to take care of them. Mm, of. Taught them how to gamble. He bought them a bicycle so they could get groceries. Yeah. He gambled. Yeah, doing the bare haircut. minimum. <laughs> Just not getting an applause from me. <laughs> I think that's probably. I, I, have you taught them a lesson about gambling? Gambling's wrong because somebody runs off with all your stuff. So. Yes, and he taught this. them not to burn the house down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I thought it was interesting that Uncle Trash didn't have a corrupting influence. At no point was his swag and his whole, like, you can throw your legs up on the table and we can play old maid and play cards, unlike your mom who says you can't play cards. Like, you could very quickly see that a story where these kids are like, Uncle Trash is cool, but they don't. So Uncle Trash is pretty foul. Like, at no point are the kids like, that's somebody to emulate. One thing that, I mean, back to the idea of resonance, there was one thing that really, I felt like it was reflected really well in the story, was Uncle Cuts is trying to care for these kids, but he's really ill-equipped to do so. And it ends in disaster. And later on, when the little boy finally catches the dog, he wants to care for this dog, so he sprays it with mosquito repellent to try to get rid of all of the bugs. And then he wants to get rid of the tick that's in its ear, so he goes to um, light the tick on fire, which is what you do. You light a tick, but it was covered in mosquito repellent. So that's why the dog catches on fire. So mm -hmm. the boy is trying to take care of the dog, and that ends in fire and disaster as well. Um, I thought that was a really poignant and really meaningful ex example of resonance and reflection in the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the story has a lot of parallels. When Uncle Trash first comes in and he's kind of going crazy looking around the house, there was a slight parale parallel in that madness with the mother's madness just before she leaves mm. that I liked as well. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that the cuts were black. I don't think it says that they're black. Cause it... may have to go, I may oh. have to go back and reread it because now I'm curious. Yeah. No. Mm. No, it, it mentions definitely changes it the reading. It definitely changes the reading. I mean, mm -hmm. it reads the same, but it's even more dramatic, I think, mm -hmm. read that way. And so I'll have to definitely go back and see. Yeah. Yeah. Also, you know what's interesting about the style not being very dramatic is normally when you're in a child's point of view, it's very cloying and melodramatic. It's like, but what? is mommy gone and it's like this over the top emotionality almost always when you're in a child point of view that I tend to find annoying sometimes and this one doesn't do that and instead being in this child point of view um, there's like some 
cause and effects that I thought were pretty funny. Like when, uh, when after Uncle Trash takes all their stuff and leaves, uh, he goes, the older, you know, the narrator, the older sibling says, there was only one thing left to do, and that is to take all we, that we still have left and throw it at my brother, and I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is great. Yeah, I, <laughs> that over-emotionality that you see in a lot of uh, writing where you're talking about a child narrator, um, I think that is a reflection of how adults see children. I don't mm -hmm. necessarily think that that is mm. what it looks like from inside the child. Yeah. And the way that this story is written is a child narrator that I really enjoy. Um, my short stories, all the ones I've published so far, all have child narrators. And I really enjoy a child narrator that feels realistic but still catches those little magical elements but at the same time is grounded and realistic. And children are not blind. They do see stuff. And I think that this story is a great example of that and definitely something that I'm going to go back and reread and study. Mm. Yeah, and no, I, th I think, yeah, I, uh, Annie is right. I think this, this was... This is really well done because at no point do they have long, deep, and meaningful conversations between them about their parents and where are they. <laughs> they, they just get on with stuff. And and I the other day I was trying to think back to to my youth about what was important, and nothing to do with my parents was important at all. I don't, you know, I remember getting heating in the house, and and then there's a, like a five year gap before something else happens. And, and, <laughs> No contact at all. So, Are you sure so, it wasn't important or is, <laughs> you just forgot? Getting heating was important. That was well important. <laughs> I bet that was a huge... But you're right. There's these gaps in my memory when I think back to being a kid. Um, there hmm. are points where my parents were important, but it's like these snapshots of things and they seem to be disconnected and they're super bright and just their emotional impact moments of childhood mm. that really seem to um, come to mind. Mm -hmm. Rami, has it worked? Have we convinced you to like the story better? Yeah, but it was interesting to hear your thoughts. <laughs> oh, that's very good. <laughs> it was a competent discussion. <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> I'm bursting with pride now. <laughs> I love Thanks, being competent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy indeed. Uh, I'll put that on my on my headstone when I die. This <laughs> is Hey, that's actually a great idea. Competently lived. <laughs> uh, yeah. Very good. Oh, I like that. I like it too. Okay. <laughs> so, was there anything else that um, came to mind that you guys would like to discuss about this story before we go on and read it? Yeah, I just want to add that I really enjoyed the little bit at the end. It's like one or two lines, but just that. The thing is, the very last line. It's like one sentence that the mom runs away again. I thought that was great. <laughs> I thought that was amazing because I, there was, so so here are these kids that are like in this tragic, horrible, destitute existence, and it's gonna go all over again. Like it's so dreary. This theme, like he, not all Richard isn't content to just be like, and basically these kids live like strays and life sucks. He's like, and it never ends. There's yeah, a cyclical part to it that I was just like, this guy is so bleak, so this, and I kind of love it. Yeah, at the end, thing. like she's running around in the field. I'm like, is she gonna run away or is she just running around the field talking to herself? <laughs> <Running> like, <away. laughs> I don't know. And that's another thing. I had to like look up the word Russell because I was like, wait, maybe there's like another meaning for it. Or, but it's literally like she's just running barefoot in in, uh, in the cornfield, like just running away. She's crazy. She's got issues. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's got issues. Yeah, but... Definitely, I definitely get the feeling that she's mentally ill and that the mm -hmm. family is trying to keep her in there. And um... but then she's been been away, and she's she's been persuaded to come back. You know, and and you can imagine that the the father you know, come back, come back. No, everything's fine. Come back. Everything will be fine. And he come back, and the house is burned down. And I, I I'm <laughs> with her. I just. I just also go. like the fact that they passed the first time. Just they passed it, it like, twice yeah. before they recognized the yard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was perfect. But yeah. we saw them drive by, and then they drove by, and, and they stopped and recognized the yard because there's no house there. 
<laughs> and, and and again, in a different author's hands, that could be one of the most depressingly written lines ever. Mm. Like, and everything was so like charred that they didn't recognize their own home, and you're like, oh no. But here, it's kind of funny. It's kind of like gallows humor because the content of the story is so dreary and so depressing and so just overwhelmingly sad that without the humor, it would actually be very difficult to get through the story. But through the use of gallows humor, we're able to really enjoy the writing and enjoy the story and feel the emotions that have a little bit of release every once in a while as we're reading the story without getting overwhelmed. Yeah. I, I, and I love the fact that, that the brother, the younger brother, is in a trance, and Uncle Trash is trying to trying to bring him out by showing him card tricks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Uncle Trash! Oh, Uncle Trash! <laughs> yeah, Sorry, Uncle Trash, I say. <laughs> yeah. So, was there anything that you guys didn't like about the story? Annie is shaking her head. No, I loved it. Yeah, hmm. Gerald, is there anything about the story that you didn't like? Uh, I, I suppose I, I suppose it's. I mean, I'll come back into that in the marking, but in the scoring. But uh, yeah, there's no sort of heavens opening and that sort of thing. But but you know, I really enjoyed it. Really, really enjoyed it. Huh. That's funny because for me, I got that little tingly feeling like when we first read Saunders. I was like, ooh, I really like this author. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little tingle in the back of your gut. Definitely felt that. <laughs> Are we ready to rate this? Yeah. I feel the lull. Yeah. I'll go first. Uh, 5.5 5 for me. Okay. Uh, for me, no surprise, it's a 6. Yeah. yeah, it's really good. I want to read more by him. I looked up his short story anthology, which is called The Ice at the Bottom of the World, which sounds like a story prompt to me. Like, if you yeah. gave me that, like, you know, it's, yeah. So I'm just like, this guy has got a lot of rich stuff in his stories, so, yeah. I was, um, I've been debating between five and a half and six for a while, because I want to give it a six, but part of me is, like, we need to give it a five and a half. I mean, is it really, like, one of the best stories you've ever read? And yeah, it is. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely getting a six for me. Yeah. Uh, I'm go. gonna go with a four, which is the lowest among mm. you, but isn't low. Yeah, you very rarely go with a four on anything. Usually, everything's like a point five or a six. So I think that says something. But Rami, I'm really confused. Walk, walk me through this. Why is right. it only a four? I told you because I, I didn't feel. Um, I didn't feel like there was any significance tied to any of the events going on. Mm -hmm. I think this is where we're getting into... I find this really fascinating because we're all writers, but Rami's a reader. And this story expects the reader to do quite a bit of work to enjoy the story. And I think because we all write, we tend to not, we tend to just leapfrog right into that. But as a pure reader, I'm wondering if this story is a story that might not be enjoyed by somebody who, who doesn't do that level of dissection of reading. You know, like, we tend to pick stuff apart. I mean, we do on the show, but we tend to anyway. And I'm thinking back to when I first read Carver, and I didn't like Carver. Probably until, like, 15 stories in, I didn't like uh -huh. Carver. Because I had to learn how to read him. And reading this writer is very similar to how I would read Carver. So I'm wondering, is this a matter of this story is just... It's it's expecting a different type of reading than the traditional short story would expect. Yeah. Well, using that logic, using that logic, we need to read more Mark Richard on the podcast to see if it works, and then Harry <laughs> loves it. <laughs> yeah. So I was thinking about something Maya said. For me, it's not so much about a lack of emotionality, but a lack of descriptive language. Like okay. you, yeah. So like, and, and I go back to this house burning down. Like there was, 
there's so much more visuals that could have been inserted in that rather than just like, oh, the house burned down or something. Like, I, I don't care about, you know, them feeling sorrow or, or remorse for what they had done or what they had lost or anything, but just being able to see what that would look like of a burning dog running into a house and, and the house engulfing in flames. So you wanted more visuals. Mm. Yeah. That makes sense. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, there I, aren't very many visuals. The visuals. It's not very visual writing. That's mm. really interesting, um, particularly because I was just listening to another writing show, and every, every example they gave was an example from a movie or a film, which I haven't seen because I don't watch very many movies or TV or anything. And... Um, and I know over time, writing has become a lot more visual. Mm -hmm. So this is really interesting. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, game time? Yeah. Yeah, game time. Game time. Game time. I, am okay, I have in. a question uh -huh. because my story is actually in my phone and I forgot to write it down so I'm on my computer without internet trying to see if I have any short stories in my in my OneNote. Have we read Good People yet? Okay, no. then that, that's the story I'm thinking. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> my story's in my phone. I can't get to it without turning off the hangout. <laughs> okay. I am putting in A Silver Dish by Saul Bellow. Ooh. Have we read any Saul Bellow yet? No, that's why I went with Saul Bellow. Ooh, Ooh good one. Oh, I, I think you should I, win. Um, yeah, I think so too. Especially. All right, Remy. it's been decided. <laughs> oh, yes. Remy <laughs> is <laughs> done today. <laughs> okay, I'm done with all y'all. Um, I'm putting in good people. I don't know the name of the author because, um, as I said, um, yeah, <laughs> oh. I'm in OneNote and the author's name is not showing up, but it's one people. It's in the New Yorker. I will find the author name while Gerald says his. Uh, and I'm <laughs> I'm desperate. I'm, I'm going to shoehorn Carve Magazine in if it kills me. Uh, you know how that disorients me by Sophia Harsha. Uh, and by the way, good people is David Foster Wallace. Okay, thank you. Because I'm like, I see the story and the authors is not listed. So now mm. we have. It sounds like we have three good examples. Mm. I think Gerald needs a. Baseball cap that says sponsored by Carve Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I should have, have some big posters behind <laughs> things. <laughs> hey, yeah, I could sell advertising space. Ooh. Anyway. I feel like I Not submitted really. that story before, but then rescinded it. Anyway. Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, Let's do a game. Yeah, so. In trying to pick a topic for this, I was torn between two because I feel like the two, we've already had games uh, done about them. So one of them could have been dogs, given the title and the fact that there are dogs in the story. But I'm not really a dog person, and there was a trivia game about Eight mail comes before. to mail at literaryroadhouse.com. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and... The second one was about cards, and I think I had already, we played a game, I, I gave you a game about cards before, didn't I? No. I thought I did. So what did you end up choosing? Cards. Well, I, I, we're, we're going to do cards. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, well, I'm not winning. <laughs> who wants to start? You I'll us. start. I'm, I, okay. I know I'm not going to win. Just start with me. Get it over with. Take okay, it. Rip the band-aid off. <laughs> no, no. Don't be so harsh. <laughs> How many one-eyed jacks are there in a card deck? One. Two. The jack of spades and the jack of hearts. They're both facing sideways and they're nicknamed the one-eyed jacks since oh, only wow. one eye is visible. Good question. Thanks. And I use. If I were talking about a suicide king, which king am I referring to? Who's this for? And I use. Okay. Oh, I can picture the card. It's hearts? Yes, it's the king of hearts. 
He's depicted with a sword by his head, and it makes it look like he's stabbing him, himself in the head with it. However, I looked into this, and the reason for that is because images of early um, English playing cards, it actually shows the King of Hearts holding an axe. But I guess over the years, due to poor copying, the axe lost its head, and the shaft of the axe was turned into a sword that mm -hmm. appears to be driven into his head. Hmm. Very good. Yeah. And Gerald, which is the only queen in the deck that faces to the right? Uh, <clears throat> I'll say Queen of Clubs. It's Spades. The Queen oh. of Spades. Yeah. Okay. All right, back to Maya. Which king has both hands showing? <laughs> like that. Me, 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 my, me, me. Diamond. Nope, it's the hearts. So one hand is on the sword and the other one's on his stomach. Hmm. All right. And Ace, which king is the only king without a mustache? Clubs? Nope, that one is also hearts. What? Mm. Everything is hearts. Yeah. Okay. He's special. Mm. <laughs> All right, finally, Gerald, to tie it. Yeah. Which two queens have the color blue on their crowns? I would say hearts and diamonds. And you would be correct. Oh, wow. Oh, I All think All right, that. now for a tiebreaker that I really, really like, because I have a whole story about this, but I'm not going to tell you <laughs> on the show. You're not? <laughs> Unless you really want to. Why don't you do the question first? It's something I heard off a YouTube video. <laughs> yeah, okay, so this is between Anais and Gerald, and whoever gets closest to a win. Mm. How many? different permutations or, or combinations of a 52 deck playing card can you have? Huh? Mm, so you have 52 cards. Mm -hmm. How many different possible combinations? If you shuffle the cards, how oh, many combinations okay. of cards? Okay. Order. Sequence. Order. Wow. Order. Wow. Oh. So Ooh. pull out your calculators. No, no point out calculators because there is a formula to figure that out. <laughs> There's a form, but I mean, and no right, whatever. I'm not going to say anything else. Just give me your guesses. Um, I can't wait. Mm. I don't know. I kind of want Joe to go first. I can go off of him. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can. I I would do say, whatever strategy you want. I, all right, I'll say 38 trillion. <gasps> Whoa, what? He just hmm? he just took the high low thing it's like right. way out there. Anyways, what do you think? <laughs> Is it only in trillions? You're talking about how many? Let me see if I understand the question. Because if you're talking, because isn't it like the 52 exclamation point was like 52 times 51 times factorial. 52 times 49 yes. times 48? That's, like yeah, that's, that's called 52 factorial. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I don't have my scientific calculator because college is long behind me. Um, but wouldn't that get you more than trillions? Like, isn't this like, pfft, right? No? I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I'm going to say a trillion and one because I think it's more than trillions. <laughs> wait, wait. You said, you said 38 trillion. Oh, 38 one. trillion. Fine. 50 trillion. 50 trillion. It's got to be higher. It's only 52 yeah. cards. Yeah. No, what do you think, that. Maya? No? What do I think? I think 52 cards. I'm going to say 5,000. No, 5,000. It's, it's, right. it's got 60. Yeah, odd so it seems like it wouldn't be a lot because it's only 52. But the answer is actually 8.658 times 10 to the 67th power. Yeah, it's a crazy high number. Mm. Which which is ridiculously crazy. And right. I can go on about this, but Anais is the winner. 
But basically, to to put it in some kind of perspective, right, the observable universe is about 13.5 billion years old, right? If you were to take this number and turn it into seconds, and if you were to shuffle a deck of playing cards every second since the beginning of the universe, you wouldn't even come close to reaching this number. (laughs) Wow. Wow. About the order of the cards, I told right? you to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. went higher than zero because I can't, I don't even know what that word would be. How would I say that? So <laughs> exactly. higher than whatever Gerald said. Okay, so we are reading um yeah. A Silver Dish by Saul Bellow. But before you go, come feed the strays in the comment section at literaryroadhouse.com. And just as I spoke that sentence, Gerald wandered into a cornfield. Please help us find him by searching the review sections for our shows at iTunes, Stitcher, and Spreaker. And while you're there, leave a review. It makes Gerald happy and more likely to come home. For hot tips on how to swindle children out of their toys, tune in to our other shows, the Literary Roadhouse Book Club and the Bradbury (laughs) Challenge. And confession time, we have a crippling podcast addiction, so set us straight by supporting our expenses at patreon.com slash literary roadhouse. Every bit helps. And as always, do not share this podcast with Uncle Trash because he will burn it down, but you can share it with everyone else. Until next time, read a good story. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. Very good. Ryan, I the nutty one.